Good morning, everyone. Uh, very uh, welcome to the meeting. Uh, I'm Xavier Portell Canal, and I am a council member uh, of the British Society of Soil Science. And I am truly delighted to welcome you all to our seven Zoom into Soil uh, webinar. First of all, let me apologize uh, that, but we had uh, uh, some uh, technical issues that prevented us to start uh, the webinar on time. So uh, please uh, let us apologize for that. So, uh, well, in, in today's event has been supported by one of our great scientific journals, uh, the European Journal of uh, Soil Science, whose editor is Professor Jenny Dungait. Before, before I give an overview of today's sessions and welcome our two speakers, I would like to introduce the British Society of Soil Science uh, as the host of today's webinar. Uh, just for those of you that are not familiar with the society, we are an established international membership organization and a charity uh, committed to the study of soil in its widest aspects. Uh, we bring together those working within academia and we have a growing uh, membership amongst practitioner, practitioners implementing soil science in industry and those with a keen interest in soils. This year, we will be running 10 Zoom into Soil uh, webinars, and the next one in the series will be hosted by the Southwest Soils Discussion Group on Wednesday, uh, the 7th of July, on the topic of soil compaction. Uh, further information will be distributed after today's event, so please bear with us. Before we begin, though, we have some basic housekeeping. Uh, as there are so many uh, of you here today, all your microphones have been uh, muted. We will be taking questions at the end of our presentations uh, when our invited guest, Philippe Bave, will monitor th this for us. So please, uh, we would like to ask you to submit any questions you have by 12.50 uh, p.m. to allow us to get through as many as uh, we can. Although as well that there is a raise your hands button, uh, we will appreciate uh, if you don't use it uh, unless the presenter specifically asks for, for it on the presentation. Also today's presentation has been awarded basis and national register of sprayers, operators, continual professional development points. If you are registered with either body, please contact us directly after the event. And finally, please be aware that today's presentation is being recorded. Without further ado, uh, I will provide first an overview of a number of initiatives uh, slash opportunities that the speakers of today's session and myself had the pleasure to be to, to be involved with. Uh, these initiatives all start uh, all began in the European Journal of Soil Science and in particular by the Russell Review, nicely written by, Prof by Professor Philippe Dave. Here, Philippe uh, illustrated uh, current practices of bypass, uh, that is uh, a deliberate avoidance of uh, all the uh, literature, uh, all, despite being uh, highly relevant for the topic, and hyperbole, which he defines as ex exaggerated claims not supported by existing knowledge or data. Uh, he focuses on soil science, of course, and provides a number of examples. Later on, on, a, on a, uh, the same Philippe suggests possible ways of tackling these issues in the invited opinion letter that follow this Russell review. Philippe's contributions at this point were uh, then replied, uh, first by the letter of Professor uh, Johan Bouma, who highlighted the needs of considering soils as part of the ecosystems and also uh, the need of an increased stress on land stakeholders. Uh, and it is, was followed by a letter authored by an international group of 20 early career researchers, Laura Lorenzo, the, present, the presenters of today, uh, Zoom into Soil, and myself uh, amongst them. In this letter, we shared our collective musing in an effort to continue the important debate started by Philippe and, and Johan Boma, uh, while giving the view of uh, scientists at early career uh, stages. Laura will introduce you the main points of our letter uh, later on. 
Uh, but also in addition uh, to these points, uh, Lorenzo and Laura uh, also started mainly assembling thoughts on the mental uh, health issue, which is the topic of Lorenzo's presentation today. So the debate was then further continued by Philippe, who replied to the letters of Johan uh, and ours uh, on a further contribution. On a personal note, uh, although uh, I'm quite confident and the rest of co-authors uh, share my view actually, I really enjoyed the process. Uh, in addition to being quite therapeutic, I reckon, uh, it, uh, it provides uh, providing, being able to provide a different point of view of the debate and contribute to the search of solutions makes you really feel a valuable piece of the community. And, and based on, that, uh, on this experience, I would uh, like to heartily encourage you all uh, early career researchers and not early career researchers as well to give it a go and, as well and, uh, and try similar initiatives. Therefore, uh, the co-authors uh, of the letter and myself would really uh, like to sincerely thank Philippe Bebe and Johan uh, Boma for starting this relevant debate in soil science in the soil science community. And also, we will really like to thank Jenny Dungate uh, for allowing the voice of early career researchers to be heard high and loud. So uh, big thanks uh, uh, for you all. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity. Nonetheless, I'm, I'm glad to say that this has been only the beginning. Uh, and we have taken the most of uh, the momentum gain uh, and keep uh, actually working on early career researchers oriented uh, events and opportunities. So we recently prepared a town hall event for uh, EGU this year on the topic of scientific publishing and also uh, are preparing a further town hall for Eurosoil 2021 that will focus on the funding system. Uh, in addition, for Eurosoil specifically, at the moment we are preparing a grant workshop that it has been made possible thanks to the collaboration of the British Society of Soil Science that is offering a grant of up to 5,000 pounds for the winner of the competition. If you are attending your soil, please do not hesitate to participate both in the town hall and in the grand competition. Later on, uh, and thanks again to the kind invitation of Jenny Dungait, uh, we are also preparing an, uh, an European Journal of Soil Science virtual issue uh, that will celebrate the work of early career researchers in soil. This virtual issue will make uh, available 25 manuscripts where the work of early career researchers has been uh, capital for two months. Uh, this the, this uh, virtual issue will be launched online the 9th of November to, con to coincide with the British Soil Science Society Early Career Conference, to where I, I would also like you uh, to encourage you to attend. Finally, uh, we are also working on generating further opportunities. It will really uh, be uh, great if you think that you can contribute and, and help us to make a difference. So if that's the case, don't be shy and, and consider joining us. So well, that's all from my side. Uh, I will now like to introduce our first presenter, uh, Laura um, Snell. Uh, Laura is a doctoral candidate uh, at the University of Bremen in Germany. Her research so far has been focusing on the interactions organic amendments like biochar and compost can have with the different compartments of the soil environment. These include influences on microbial diversity and abundance, microbial habitat quality, but more recently also uh, aggregate level soil organic matter dynamics and soil organic matter quality following repeated amendments of biochar and compost in tropical soils. She aims to finish her, uh, her PhD this year and uh, subsequently pursue a career in the spiking field of soil science. For further research activities, she envisions diving more into the field of special explicit 
organomineral and micro-mineral interactions. In addition to that, in her spare time, Laura enjoys a good hike and traveling the globe uh, with friends, uh, current circumstances uh, permitting, of course. So uh, over to you, Laura. Okay, thank you so much. I hope that the sound's working fine. Yeah, could you please confirm? Oh, thank you so much. I'm afraid that I've been responsible for the technical difficulties. So sincere apologies for that. And um, thanks again for the opportunity to speak here. And um, thanks to Xavi's great introduction. I think um, there's not really much that I need to say here <laughs> um, on behalf of this co-authoring team um, that we are. Um, and what I'm going to present today is based um, on the letter to the editor of the European Journal of Soil Science that Xavi mentioned earlier. Um, here you can see basically the header of this article. And if you're interested, of course, please feel free to copy paste the DOI and just um, go check it out. <laughs> um, yes, next slide, please. Um, if that's Oh, yes. So I'm going to get head on to the topic. Um, we thought that as early career researchers ourselves, uh, we are facing so many challenges. Um, you can see them here, lovely depicted as those um, reddish arrows. And um, these challenges that we face, of course, they come from our own inspiration and ambitions, but are also kind of um, maybe imposed is a bit of a strong word, but you get the sense, um, by different actors in the academic fields. And as you can see, um, clearly some of those um, demands or challenges, they are mutually exclusive. And of course, publication plays a great role in this set of challenges that we face. Um, next slide. And when we talk about publications, I think it is always um, a good approach to think that there are always two sides, which are, next slide. Um, as early career researchers, but every researcher, I think, is first and foremost a reader um, of academic publications. And um, the more we progress in our careers, the more we become also authors. And of course, naturally, Readers and authors, um, sorry, one slide back, please. As readers and authors, um, we have different um, interests in the publishing business that it is nowadays. As a reader, we want um, the publication in the best case to be fair, um, fair that is findable, accessible, interoperable, and also reusable. And for accessible, of course, that often re means open access. And we want it to be also relevant. And relevant means context specific, um, which in my case, for example, I work with tropical soils in Africa and, and there's little citable information available on the topic that I work on. So it is hard for me to get context specific relevant information. And as an author, of course, first and foremost, we want to be published. Not only that, but also citable which means that often um, we rely on journals that um, have no fees for authors, um, reasonable handling times, particularly as PhD students who rely on um, quick publication more or less. And in order to be citable, of course, we want to be published in high quality journals um, in order to have a reputation or to build a reputation. and. I think um, these different interests, they are not always easy to reconcile, which is why, next slide please, which is why um, we think that um, maybe it is time to explore new avenues um, of, um, of the publishing, it's hard to say business, um, but I'd rather say commoning because what we produce is knowledge that is in the best case available to the public. It is a common good that is supposed to um, profit all of humanity. Next slide. Um, and we have taken the liberty, 
based on um, the publications that have been mentioned before to formulate um, some suggestions. Um, for example, in order to avoid bypass, um, we think it would be very helpful um, that students at a very early stage, but also early career researchers practice profoundly the systematic discussion of classic, that is paradigmatic literature in their field, and also learn to acknowledge and um, maybe criticize literature that is um, from their own field, but depicts a view that is not their own, because um, contradiction and debate is so natural in science um, that it would be very sad to lose this. Um, as referees um, and also topical editors, handling editors, um, I think this is a role that is maybe a bit under acknowledged because it just takes so much time and diligence and um, does not always yield direct results for the person doing the work. So I think we would need more acknowledgement for this very important role. I think there are promising approaches to this, like Publons, for example, where you can rate your reviewers um, so they get proper acknowledgement um, when they do a good job, which they most of the time do. And also, um, personally, I think I know that there are a lot of different views on preprint publishing, but I personally um, would say let's be very positive about this because um, I think this could really continue um, to a debate in publishing, um, particularly when servers are used where um, everyone in the field can comment on a manuscript because I believe this could also really make the role of a reviewer easier because um, like this, knowledge and critical knowledge and review can be crowdsourced. And isn't that great? An opportunity for um, democratizing our debating culture in the sciences. Um, next slide, please. And this would be probably the most important message um, of this talk that publishing really should be seen by every one of us as a means to, to engage and exchange between different scientists and just enjoy how lively this discourse and sometimes also this debate can really be if uh, we are not afraid of, um, in a friendly way of course, criticizing each other and being criticized and really creating a living body of knowledge and not something that is meant to be engraved in stone. Next slide. Um, yeah, here I try to visualize <laughs> um, that, of course, this is a common endeavor that um, all of the scientific community should undertake. This should be symbolized by the picture in the bottom left corner. But also, we really believe um, this is um, a picture from a fairy tale uh, from Bremen, where I study, um, that most of the responsibility, I think, should be assumed by those who are most strongest, because we need flagship institutions and flagship people um, who can really create momentum. And um, we cannot kind of dispose this task on the shoulders of those who are most vulnerable, but we really invite um, people to use their influence to um, bring this process forward. Yeah, this is what I think I have to say. Um, thanks a lot for your lovely attention. I'm really curious for your questions and comments. Savi, I think you're still muted. Sorry, thank you, Laura, for this nice presentation. Uh, uh, just as a reminder, we will be taking questions for both speakers at the end of the session. So let's move on now to our next speaker, uh, Lorenzo Rossi. Uh, Lorenzo is a research fellow at the University of uh, Milan after compl uh, completing a Dawal PhD in functional ecology at the University of Montpellier 
and in methods and models for engineering at the University of Casino. His research deals with soil plant interactions and soil carbon cycle, uh, and soil carbon cycle, which an, with an applied interest in the use of sustainable solutions for ecosystem services maximization in the natural and engineering domains. Uh, Lorenzo's current research topic in uh, the University of Milan focuses on the biogeochemical cycles in natural forests, uh, dealing with carbon storage and physiological responses to natural disturbances and forest management. Growing up in a family predominantly composed of psychiatrists, psychotherapists and psychoanalysts has uh, made Lorenzo interested in the application of mental health on his discipline, uh, that's that's why he is here today. But the, this has also been has also made him uh, a stay away from being a psychologist himself. So uh, welcome and over to you, Lorenzo. Thank you so much, Xavier, for the introduction. I would like to ask if you could see my if you can see my my screen right now. Uh, yes. Thank you, perfect. So we're ready to go. Uh, well, thank you, Xavier, really for the introduction and for inviting me, participating in this discussion to Professor Mavai for uh, for the response and the inputs and for Laura for the interesting talk that we just heard. And uh, I think that my, my, my presentation needs a little introduction because as I said, uh, well, I'm not a shrink, but I grew up in a family of shrinks. So when uh, Xavier asked me, uh, for uh, an input on, on the response of uh, the article of uh, Professor Babe, uh, I immediately thought about the issues that mental health can have on, um, not only on, on us as human beings, but on, also on the discipline and on our way of, of, of doing our job. Uh, and this is why I'm here uh, talking to you about mental health. Uh, I think that this is not, as I said, is, I'm not a specialist, it's not a specialistic presentation, but it's um, an open discussion. I would love to know your uh, ideas on mental health and if you have any uh, solution to propose about this issue that we're facing. Uh, so I don't want to point fingers. I don't want to say institutions are bad. I don't think this is the truth. I think we are here in this all together and we just need to brainstorm um, a way to have a more, maybe a more healthy work environment to do better research. So uh, I think that the, the issue, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's well known. Uh, I think that part of the issue is that mental health perception increased in the last decade. Uh, and we are more open to talk about it. Uh, but however, the, the numbers regarding uh, early stage researcher and especially PhD students are very high, kind of three times, I think, the number of like the average population. So we have 30 to 40 percent of PhDs in the verge of depression and uh, well, high number of attempted suicide as well. Uh, and um, of course, this is due to the probably, well, again, I don't have answers, but I think it's due to all the burdens that early stage researchers have on their back. Um, and these, we all know them, but here it's a bit wrap up. Uh, so the extreme workload together with the lack of personnel and lack of fundings. And while well, we have this publication pressure because our, our future depends on it, uh, so we all think, oh, I'm not publishing enough and it should publish more and better. And uh, well, it's difficult to try to shut off that, uh, that little voice. There is the problem that I think, I think that some of these, let's say some of these issues are uh, due to the, to the society we live in and the economic system, but some of them are more uh, related to our, uh, to our job, to our work line. One of these is the separation from loved one. Uh, we are asked to go in different institutions. The more you travel in different institutions, the better it is for your career. Uh, but we are usually separated for, from our family, from our friends. And it's something that it's very close to me. And uh, I, I said I decided to just avoid a job and go back to Milan 
uh, where I am right now. Oops, I don't know what's happened. Okay. Um, and this was during the first lockdown. That was a very tough period for everybody, I think. And I was alone in my apartment in France, in Montpellier. It was like seven years that I wasn't in, in Italy anymore. And I was like, okay, I'm done with it. I want to go back to my friend, to my family, to my girlfriend. And uh, and it's something that uh, it, it was strange to me to that it took so much time to take this decision, actually. Um, well, of course, all of these together bring to a very uh, high unbalance between work and life. And we all know that from the weekends and the evenings that we spend working. And this is true not only in the present, but also when thinking about the future because of the lack of perspective that there is in academia. Uh, because we all know that the chances to, to become a professor basically is slim to none. Uh, and uh, so we, we feel, especially in this early stage of our career, a, a high fear of future, what we can be, what will, will happen. And this brings us to a, an over-competitive environment a lot of time. Not always, it's, it's actually not my experience, but I, I heard a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, nightmare stories from colleagues sometimes. And uh, the same I could say about the low support from colleagues and supervisors. It's something that I found while I was reading to prepare this presentation and my piece for the um, for a paper we're preparing. Um, that the, a lot of time we feel low support. Um, it, actually, it's not my 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 case. I think I was very lucky even during my studies. But again, I think that all of us are some uh, nightmare stories to 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 tell or that somebody told. So well. All of these uh, is not great uh, for our mental health, but also for research. So these, I think, it's one of the take-home message that I would like to to give. That uh, mental health, it's not, uh, it's it's a problem for research itself. There is um, big bodies of literature. Uh, one uh, can be the polyvagal theory from Borges. Uh, I don't know a lot about it. But again, my uncle, one of the many shrink of my family, explained it to me while I was talking to him about this presentation. Uh, basically, our, our mind, uh, it has some vegetative states that affect our reaction and how we behave. And of course, creative work like uh, research, it's facilitated and it's, it comes out better when our mind is in a state of security, of freedom, of mutualism and of play. And uh, it doesn't work when we are in a, in, a, in a state of alarm, of fight or flight. Uh, and this is not per se bad, because maybe if you are a professional boxer, you're looking for these to be sharp, to be more sharp uh, in your fight, but uh, not if you're a researcher, of course. And this means that our research, if in a more comfortable uh, and um, secure kind of uh, environment would benefit and would be better. Uh, there is an economic problem. Uh, of course, uh, only 56% of PhDs finish their, uh, their research. What is the cost of it? What is the cost of all the data we have in drawers that nobody knows anything any, anymore? Uh, what is the cost of all the experiments, of all the conferences, of all the travels that the institution paid for research that never finished? So there is an economical issue there. And of course, there is the problem of the bypass and hyperbolis. I think uh, I read a lot and I, I like to read uh, the uh, Professor uh, Bave uh, paper and especially the piece in which he said, it's uh, we need to go back to uh, make research on a single topic and spend time on this topic, even uh, without the security, without being sure of having any result, because this is what research it's uh, it's about sometimes. Uh, but how can how can it be possible when you are in a constant state of uh, worrying for your future, of not knowing if you will uh, if you will have a job the next year, if you don't have enough grant, and so there is, I think, a problem that it's practical and economical and financial, and there is a problem that it's really on mental health, on the state of our mind. I would never be comfortable now saying, okay, I will do this for the next five years without knowing what will happen. Uh, because, well, I need to eat. Uh, finally, uh, so this is a little bit of an overview, but 
what we did was brainstorm a little bit between us, between our, let's say, think tank of, of, of uh, early stage researcher, to try to propose maybe not solutions, uh, but uh, something, suggestions for new early stage researchers, um, or maybe some, yeah, some to propose something new that we can adopt for the benefit of our mental health. So what can I do as a researcher? Uh, I think everybody should try to avoid over dispersion and uh, try to learn to say no when you have too many things to do. And uh, also supervisor and PIs, uh, they should learn to accept the no as well and understand that like uh, uh, people need to uh, go out and have a drink with friends. Uh, Again, have a drink with friends, possibly not always in academia. I think that a lot of time we close ourselves in a bubble, especially when you are outside of your um, of your country, you don't know anybody, you tend to go out only with people of academia. And this is, uh, it's not great because you get cut off and always in the same, uh, in the same discourses, in the same problems, in the same issues. So try to uh, um, go out of it a little bit. Oops. Um, play sports, remember you're more kind, of course, and remember that we are stronger together and not in competition. All the good research I have done, I've done it with someone else and usually with some early stage uh, researchers. Uh, and so cooperating, it's the base for research, I think. And we need to always remember it and try to help each other in moments of need. Uh, we need to normalize seeking counseling, and this is something that is getting better and better, and feel entitled to seek advice outside our, our group, our institution, outside our field as well, uh, to explore something new and some new possibilities for the future. Not to think that if you don't get that permanent position in research, your career is over. There are a lot of paths in life that we can explore. Um, always communicate, always communicate with your advisor, uh, with your colleagues, uh, with your friends, uh, try to use social networks, find groups that have your same issues or that work on same topics and try to exchange, um, uh, exchange feelings and ideas as much as possible. Uh, try to build a research strategy. It's, a, it's, a, it's an advice that always come out and don't think that you always need to win the super incredible grant, but try to build your way up and uh, start small, but think big. So this is what can we do with some suggestions, but what can our institution do? Of course, provide counseling. It's a key and it's something that it's getting better and better. Uh, maybe, I don't know how can we all agree on these or the institution, but I was thinking why not setting a maximum number of publication per PhD or per year in general for a researcher. If uh, one person could publish on one or two paper per year, he would make sure they're good, they're meaningful, and they would be well, uh, well thought instead of just um, general. Uh, a lot of time, PhDs have low salaries, and so why don't we try to uh, fund um, fund uh, uh, travels for PhD? They're expensive to go and visit their family. I think that that, that would uh, benefit a lot mental health. And uh, establish some lab rule, uh, for example, no emails after working hour, or just don't expect an answer if you send one. Um, and uh, try to increase uh, meetings with uh, partners that are not academic. Again, to remind people that there is other possibilities uh, other than academia. And finally, there is the big bottleneck issue that all of us know. PhDs increased a lot. Chances to get a permanent position are low and to become a professor as linked to none. So maybe, or decrease the PhD position, that could be a solution actually. Um, or maybe think about the diversity of permanent position other than professor, uh, professorship. But of course, this is an economical problem that uh, I, I don't have the means to solve, but of course uh, we need to address this, this bottleneck issue somehow. 
So, um, well, this is more or less all. Uh, I know that was a green presentation. It was not fun to prepare, actually, and read all these papers that are here in the references, if you're, uh, if you're curious. So, I would like to, to thank you and leave you with uh, some, uh, some pills that I got from our network that are, these are things that we think are good for our mental health uh, that come from being a uh, researcher. So thank you very much. One of them, it's been among the forests instead of an office. I think that's a very good thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo, for this great presentation that touches all. Um, I'm delighted to welcome now uh, Philippe Babé as uh, our invited guest uh, to lead the question and answers uh, session. Uh, Philippe has been monitoring the questions you have been sending in and he will ask you questions uh, to the panelists. Just a reminder, please uh, submit your questions by 12.50, uh, so you still have a uh, few minutes to give us the chance to get to as many uh, questions as possible. Uh, Professor Philippe Babé is a soil scientist. Uh, he His career has been spent in the uh, United States in various universities in Dundee, Scotland, as a co-director of the Sambayo Center and in Paris, uh, France. He, he now co-directs a small, a small think tank in France, the St. Luc uh, Research Institute. Among many publications in various disciplines, uh, he, uh, as you, you know, uh, recently authored the series of essays on bypass and hyperbole in soil science I just uh, introduced at the beginning. Uh, he is actually uh, is analyzing the current situation in soil science and changes uh, and the changes needed to make it more appealing to young researchers. So uh, before before I took the I take the most of the opportunity to to ask you a question uh, myself um, before uh, asking the, the other questions, if you if you uh, allow me, uh, as a starter as a, as a starter of this uh, relevant debate, and, uh, and as a person having gone through all career career stages in soil science, uh, what would you advise to someone starting soil science today? And what would you say to your uh, to, to your peers at uh, uh, more advanced stages of soil science to to improve uh, this situation? You're, you're asking me the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I would be tempted to say uh, persevere to the young ones. Uh, I think because I'm optimistic and I think things will change in the future. Uh, they're bleak now, I, I admit it and I wrote about it, but I think they will improve because they, they have to. Uh, to my peers, to people my age, I'm, I'm uh, retired and, and uh, old, uh, so I can, I can speak freely. I, uh, I think Lorenzo talked about the field being over competitive. I think the whole of science is, is too competitive, it's way too much to produce good science. And I think I would tell my peers, stop being God, so goddamn competitive. I mean, I go to meetings and, and people look down at me because they have a thousand or two thousand more citations than I do. Uh, this is ridiculous. Uh, how, how, I imagine when you start in, your, in the career, it must be daunting to face that kind of competitive, competitiveness and uh, it's not healthy. So this, these would be the two things that I would say. Um, now, uh, I, I wrote everything that I have to say I don't, in, in these papers in EJSS, so I, I don't have anything new at this stage, I think, except perhaps on this competitiveness issue. Uh, I noticed that there are quite a few very interesting questions and I'd like to ask them and have uh, Laura and Lorenzo respond to, to them because they are the ones we're listening to today. There's a, a good question from Wilfred. It's rather long, but it's really to the point. Um, a question to Laura. Uh, it's related to pre-publishing. Wilfred Otten asks, for, Wilfred is from Cranfield, 
asks, what platform would you envisage to support this effort uh, relating to pre-publishing pre and at what stage would you expect this to occur? Should there be a first stage where quality and rigor of the research is reviewed or can this take place through open debates? At what stage does an article then move to a journal submission and if rejected, does it get withdrawn? Um, so if Laura can get get in uh, and answer that question that would be great okay um yeah thanks a lot wilfred i'm very glad about this question i think it is a great question um short disclaimer i am not an expert on publishing myself yet <laughs> um in our town hall at the UFU this year um we had several initiatives not only on open access publishing but also on preprint publishing presenting themselves. And frankly, I really think that the field of soil science has a great deal to learn um, in this regard from other disciplines, um, like um, life sciences, for example, but also um, mathematics and physics. I think they are much more advanced in terms of um, preprint services that operate at different stages of rigor and i would say the the rigor that you apply um probably should depend um on i mean maybe that sounds um, a bit unspecific but on the purpose of your publication um of course something that is meant um maybe as something rather practical um is different from something that you aim to publish um, maybe in nature. I think this is very clear. And also I'm a great fan of these things um, that eLife does. For example, eLife is, has, I think they have set out as a journal, um, but now they operate more like a preprint service where you can submit your manuscript and then can have it kind of certified. So the batch of high quality peer review remains, um, but publication is not limited to this. And also um, what I have found very interesting myself is um, what SOIL does, for example, as an, as an EGU publication body that um, the discussion is publicly available once your manuscript is accepted. And I think this is very fair to the authors, but also the reviewers. So I think um, the whole set of ethical considerations ensue in a very different way when you talk about preprint publishing. And I think um, we really should be courageous um, to explore these. I very much hope this answers the question. <laughs> if not, um, just feel free to get back to this after um, the seminar. Well, if I could follow follow up with an, with another question um, or a comment, uh, a comment I've heard very often from researchers about these journals that uh, open discussion to the whole community for people to comment on manuscripts is that we barely have time to read manuscripts that have already been been checked and vetted by colleagues. Uh, we don't really have much time to uh, go into literature that uh, may have flaws and may disappear after a while because they're not sound, etc. Uh, I, I know for a fact I've never contributed to any of these discussion uh, discussions of, of unpublished papers because I feel well. Let's wait for reviewers to do their job and then and then we'll see. So uh, that, that's more a comment uh, than than a question. But maybe you can react to that as well. Yeah, I think probably you're right. And at the same time, I think particularly early career researchers um, sometimes tend to be either very critical or very open towards the publications that they review simply because they don't have so much experience yet. Um, so I believe that um, particularly for them, crowdsourcing um, from the more or less public discussion could really be a resource. And also, I mean, when an article gets a lot of questions and comments um, on the preprint, it clearly has hit a nerve, whether the publication is of good quality or not, but it um, somehow also is a good image of um, what is of interest to the community. Of course, it should not be a clickbait, but um, 
maybe this is something that could be used as an indicator as well. Uh, we have a, a whole bunch of questions on mental health. Obviously, Lorenzo's talk has uh, has uh, intrigued lots of people. Uh, I'd like to ask him a question to start. Uh, he's mentioned competition a number of times or excessive competition, uh, and and he alluded to some solutions. Uh, can can you uh, give a little more of your own feeling of what needs to be done to change that that uh, that atmosphere? Basically, I, I can I can relate to one little thing that I, I have experienced myself in the U.S. You mentioned that uh, early career scientists in Europe, for example, they have to compete for funds from the get go, basically from the start, and it's hard. Uh, in the U.S., when you get a faculty position, you get a wh whole chunk of money, uh, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars, with, with which you're free to do pretty much what you want to get your research started. Uh, now, we could imagine that competition would be kind of made easier for young researchers in all over the world in other ways as well. Can you do you have ideas of how that can be done, and how how competition affects you directly? Well, uh, I think, uh, again, that's a very hard question because I think that there are two, two sides of this. One, it's very practical, as you were mentioning, competition for money, competition for fundings, competition for publications, because that will assure you uh, uh, a future in, in, acad in academy. And this is something... Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a naive person, so I, I, I like what I do. And I never think too much about competition. I'm wrong about that, probably. But um, uh, because at the end, you, when you're competing for a position, you are a number of articles, you are an impact factor on a, a paper and a nice picture. Uh, so a lot of time, a competition is needed for this. On the other hand, and this is, I don't know, that's my personal opinion, I think. Uh, it's, it's not possible to, to, to have a, a, a real answer about that. But my, my experience is that um, researchers, uh, a lot of time, they feel they are, you know, above the average person. So our job is understanding things and we study a lot and we, uh, we have the answers that others don't. And this is something that it's fitted to us in our kind of uh, institutions and in our environment. And this brings us to always try to be, um, yeah, the, the best uh, that we can in terms of a publication and in terms of, of, yeah, just numbers. As you were saying, oh, you have 2,000 citation more than you and they they look to you for you to you from from up to down i don't know how to say that but uh, i think that the problem it's a little bit the a bit the aura of also uh, almost holiness of research in which a lot of time it's not seen as a job but it's seen as a mission and your mission is to unravel the mysteries of life or things like this, you know? While instead, I think that research is, uh, first of all, it's the job that you learn, uh, you enjoy, you do with passion, and you try to do as, uh, as good as you can for, uh, for yourself and for the other, but not to outshine other people. So, uh, sorry, I kind of digress here, but I think that there are two, two problems. One, it's competition for uh, for fundings uh, and the other is competition for this idea of I don't know being above above the others a little bit and it's something that maybe we as as researchers and uh, as teachers as professors we need to tone down a notch uh, when we talk about research I think mm -hmm. Yeah, something I would like also to say to this, um, if I may. Sure. Okay, um, I also think I would, first of all, of course, agree with Lorenzo on this one. And I would also um, like to highlight the role that PIs play in this process. Um, 
Because from my experience, if you have a PI and who supports you as an early career researcher, who helps you bring out really the best in you, you are less afraid of this competitive field. Um, and you perceive your peers as less of a threat. Whereas when you feel really unprotected, you get paranoid and um, you basically don't talk to anyone. Um, so I think um, they can really make a difference here. Um, just simply, <laughs> I'd like to say, by providing high quality advice. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have a question, a similar question from Javier for, for both of you, actually, both Lorenzo and, and Laura. If, you, if there is one thing you can change, or you could change in, in the, the context that you have dealt with, what would it be? So what kind of mental health issue, Lorenzo, do you think should be addressed first? And Laura, what kind of uh, challenge is most important for early career scientists that needs to be resolved? Well, if I may start. Uh, Shortly, briefly. Me, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you're right. Briefly, I think it would be the fear of future. Uh, I think that a lot of mental health issues would be. Um, Uncertainty about the future. Yeah, it's about future. It's about having a permanent position. It's about having a permanent income. It's something that, uh, at least in Italy, you are not sure until you're like 35, 40. Is part of the problem, as, as Wilfred mentioned in another question, that we're in academia, we're focusing too much on getting a, a professorial position uh, and that we're, we're preparing every, everybody for that when we know only 0.5% of the people will ever get one. Uh, maybe that's, we're not realistic in what we're preparing for. Yes, I think we should prepare for any kind of position in academia. I think we should uh, remember and or, or, or outside of academia as well and stuff and try to you know open more doors uh -huh. Laura yes um, I think that's also a great question and I would say although this may seem unrelated to publishing at first sight is increase the baseline funding because as long as publications are the currency in academia that we are measured by um, I think this vicious loop will just continue because um, it, the, 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 the feeling of, of lack will remain unless um, the baseline funding is increased. Mm -hmm. there, there used to be, uh, at least in countries like Germany, France, and I think Great Britain as well, many years ago, every researcher in soil science would get a baseline funding and it would not be competitive, it would be automatic. Every year you'd get some money, and if you collaborated with others on joint projects, there would be sufficiently to carry on decent research, which people did, and they actually had great ideas. Um, we, we got away from with all of that. In France, basically, all the funding has become competitive, and I, I don't think that's very good for your researchers. I agree with you, Laura. I yes, think baseline, I think baseline Jeff funding is essential. Yeah, also I think in Germany we have this issue that um, universities are managed by the federal states, so you can be lucky or not, depending on where you study. Mm -hmm. um, there are other questions. Um, Hannah Bauli wonders for Lorenzo, uh, how the rates of poor mental health attempted suicide compared to those in the general population or in, in particular professions. Are soil scientists more prone to suicide than others? Uh, soil scientists, I don't know, scientists, yes. Uh, it's, uh, it's proved the depression, it's uh, three times, four times the one of the general public. And uh, yeah, it's, it's I, I don't know about suicide, depression for sure, it's about three times higher uh, or even more. So not great. Uh, Rupert, I think, echoes some of the, Rupert Goddard uh, echoes some of the things you mentioned. Uh, he says, with the move to work from home because of COVID, whilst writing my thesis, uh, perhaps it's not only related to COVID, maybe it's because he's writing his thesis. He says, I'm, I really miss the academic banter and discussions that I have when working from lab and office. And so there's an added component to that these days because 
many of us have been forced to work from home and, and don't necessarily enjoy it like like I do. <laughs> but uh, there is uh, a companionship and, and, and this social aspect of research that is equally important. Absolutely, Come yeah, but uh, absolutely, I, I don't like working from home, honestly, but I like to go back home you know, to my family and friends and uh, girlfriend and blah, blah, blah. So I think that what I was talking was not working simply from home, but was uh, enabling people to not having to go around like crazy for 10 years in different states every two years, postdoc after postdoc, looking for a, uh, for a position. Mm -hmm. uh... Caroline Borden uh, has a comment, I'm sorry if I mispronounced the name, but has a comment about this uh, fear of the future. Uh, is present, she says it's present in people who do not aim for an academic career as well. Uh, example, the business, business work is very competitive as well and finding one's place in it is difficult. So it's not just uh, those who seek academic careers. Um, I don't have much experience with the, the real world so maybe you can comment on that or someone else can i yeah me neither if i have to be honest but uh, in fact what i was saying is that there are uh, one level of uncertainty that it's given by our socioeconomic system and cultural system uh, uh of, of globalism and all that stuff but it's a bit too political for now i think and uh, the other one uh it's about academic I don't know, I don't have, I have to be honest, I don't have data, but I have my experience compared to the experience of my friends, the same age in different fields. And most of them, most of them, they have security, at least security, that they will have a job the year that comes. I don't, I'm tied to a postdoc contract that finish in one year. And of course, my professor likes me and I hope, and we think, okay, we will have funds for next year. But that's not certain. And what about two years? And what about three years? And what about four years? Uh, it's true. It's not only academy, uh, academic uh, work that it's like this, but I think it's very stressed. And because the problem is that this is the normal kind of path in uh, academic uh, work uh, field. Instead, in others' field, it's a bit, uh, it's usually it's not like this. It can be the exception, let's say. Let me ask a yeah. quick question for both of you, uh, very quick. Uh, to what extent is, are the problems that young researchers face attributable to the fact that people my generation did such a poor job convincing the public that soils are important? Uh, I've seen the number of, um, the, the amount of money devoted to soils decrease over the last 40 years, it's been pathetic. We still don't do a good job convincing the public at large that soils are really important. Hence, there's very little money for it. Hence, the, it's very difficult for people to find jobs. I would like to start. I have an idea about this one. Um, I would say, we only have a few more seconds. I would say no, because in other fields where more money is in, the conditions are worse. For example, biomedical research, and they have a big industry behind them. So the failures have nothing to do with not convincing the public that soils are important. Good. Lorenzo, <laughs> no comment? I would say, I, I honestly don't know, but I would say that it's that's not the issue. I think that uh, soils are important and when there are money to make, soils are always important. Uh, maybe they're not uh, well as sexy as other fields in, in academic work but uh, I don't know about that <laughs> okay 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 so uh, on behalf of the British Society of Soil Science I would like to express our thanks to uh, Laura and Lorenzo for these interesting presentations and also uh, to you Philippe for joining and sparkling the, the discussion uh, and uh, the question and answer session. So uh, really a, a big thanks. Um, thank you also uh, to Jenny Gate and the European Journal of Soil Science uh, for your support in today's webinar. Uh, thank you all as well for attending. Uh, you will find the 
quick uh, feedback survey uh, when you leave the webinar, which we really hope you, you will take the time to complete. It will help us uh, to improve these sessions. Uh, the recording of this video will be also available after the event on, uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you also uh, will be interested in joining the society as an early career uh, member from 21 pounds per annum, um, where we have a dedicated early uh, career committee, please check out our website uh, on www.soils.org.uk uh, to view the benefits and also find out how to, uh, how to apply. We have uh, some ex exciting events uh, coming up for early uh, career members uh, with a talking about soil uh, workshop and meet the committee event on 21st of July and our early career conference from 11 to 13 October. Uh, I already mentioned uh, previously, keep an, eye, uh, keep an eye on our website and the early careers Twitter page for uh, more details please we would like to 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 take this opportunity as well to remind you that the society are uh, are organizing the next uh, world congress of soil science on behalf of the international union of soil sciences the congress theme is soil science crossing boundaries changing society and will focus on the link between soil and society with sessions covering both uh, soil systems, soil processes, soil management, and how we interact with and use uh, soils around the world. So save the date, uh, please, in your diaries for uh, 21, uh, 21st of July to 5th of August, uh, 2022. In the meantime, uh, please keep an eye on our website for forthcoming events, and we look forward to seeing you again on Wednesday, the 7th of July for the next uh, in the series of Zoom into Soil. So thank you so much for attending and uh, goodbye.